Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through the solutions to the cell automaton exercise. Um, I said I really, I really, I still use it in this course because it's a good motivating example. But I'll, I will go through. So that the, the, a lot of what I asked on the sheet I actually covered in the, in the, um, in the way I, I described it, and we've done this um, we have the pseudo code. So there's various ways you could paralyze this. The, the first paralyzation strategy you could imagine is you could take the road, so here I've got a road of length eight with some one, two, three, four, five um, cells on it, five cars on it, and you could broadcast the data to, to say, I'm just going to imagine two processes here. You could broadcast the data to two processes. So every process has a copy of the entire road, okay? And then you just have to decide which part to update. So I say, well, I have a copy of the entire road, but if I'm process one, I'll update the first four cells. And if I'm process two, I'll update the, 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 the end four cells. And I don't need to do any other communication here because I have a copy of the entire road. So I can just update what I need to update. That's fine. Um, but then the important point is I then have to globally resynchronize all the data after each move because I want to, what I want, in this parallelization strategy, I want to make sure that every process has an entire copy of the entire row, which is always up to date, which means that any process can update any piece it wants. So we need to globally resynchronize all the data after each move. So we need to make sure that, that the road is coherent, but that will require communications, obviously. Every process stores the entire state of the calculation. This is called a replicated data strategy. So it, 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 it's feasible, but at least for the, for, for the traffic model, there are two reasons why this is why this is a bad a bad parallelization strategy. One is to do with efficiency, and one is to do with memory. Can anyone think of why is this not a good thing to do? It's not what I described. Right. So, so for memory, that so, so it's very very inefficient in terms of memory. So I sometimes say the only reason you do parallel computing is to make calculations go faster, and that's not completely true. You often do parallel computing to get more memory. So on Archer, Archer is made up of 5,000 nodes, each of which has 24 CPUs on it. There's, um, there's typically 64 gigabytes on a node, and times 5,000 is <coughs> how many terabytes, that is a lot, okay? If I use this parallelization strategy, you're saying, I can never, I have to be able to fit the whole road on each process. That's saying the road can't be more than a couple of gigabytes long. So I've got terabytes of data on the, on the machine, but I can only run a simulation which is a gigabyte because I'm, I'm demanding that each process have an entire copy of the data. So, so in fact, um, the way that message pattern calculations work is you, 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 you distribute the data, and that allows you to, you will only want each process to have the minimal data. Okay? But it's also inefficient in terms of, 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 of communication. Why is that? It's going to be limited by the network speed. If yeah. Those are two separate boxes. Because the data has to go to it, be processed, and sent back every time. They're going to be fundamentally limited yeah. by the rate at which you can move the data. Exactly. Around. So I've been a bit, a bit, a, a bit woolly here. Globally resynchronize has all the data. But basically, you're basically the, the, every time you update a small part of the array, you're having to communicate the whole array to everybody to resynchronize it. And that's just simply not, 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 work, not efficient. What you have to do is you have to have a strategy which, which, um, which, takes, which takes advantage of the, of, the, of the structure of the program. And we know here that actually, to update a piece of road, you only need to know the information to your nearest neighbors. There are situations where this does work. The situation where this does work is where the calculation is very, very in intensive. So the reason that it won't work here is that for a road of length n, we're only doing n calculations. Updating the road is, is, is linear in the size of the road. If I was doing some kind of um, gravity simulation where these particles interacting through gravity, then each particle would interact with every other particle. And so the communication would be of order n squared. And so, in fact, in, 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 in situations where you have a lot of calculation for the amount of data, you could act, this can be worthwhile because although you're doing too much communication, it's actually dominated by the calculation. You're spending minutes calculating and a few seconds communicating. So there are situations where people do do this replicated data strategy, but typically it's not a good thing to do. So what you want to do is you want to scatter the data. You want to say, I've got a road of length eight, but each each process will only have a subsection of the road. So I scatter the data at the start. And then the important point is here that the internal cells can be updated independently. It's important to realize that if you have 
four, it doesn't look so obvious with four, but if I had four cells here, I can update these cells independently. It's only these cells which depend on my neighbors. Or if I had, if my local order was length 100, 98 of the cells could be updated independently. I can update those cells. I only need to communicate with the boundary data, okay? I need to compute, compute the edge set, uh, communicate the edge cells with my neighbors. And also we need to do a, a global communication to sum the local number of moves in each. So each process can work out how many cars moved on its piece of road, but I'm interested in the total number of cars that move, and that requires a collective communication to sum that up. Um, so the way it would work, so the important point about this is, first of all, load balance isn't an issue. If you've been on the, on the course Monday, Tuesday, you'll realize what this is. But what we're saying here is that we can just split the road up into equal pieces, because in the naive way I've programmed it up, um, if you have, if two processes have the same length of road, they spend the same amount of time uh, calculating. So split the road into equal sides of, of side n over p, where n is the road size 15, and p is the number of processes, maybe three. The real street cell i depends on i minus one and i plus one, and therefore the, the n over p minus two interior cells can be updated independently in parallel. So that's quite important. Only the edge cells require information from other processes. And it's actually interesting um, that if you have these, these halo cells, these ghost cells, in the serial code they're updated by copying, in the parallel code they're updated by through message passing, but the structure is identical. Update the boundary conditions, update the road, update the boundary conditions, update the road. It's just that updating the boundary conditions requires communication in the parallel, in the parallel model. So we require communication to get the value of the edge cells from other processes and to produce a global sum of the number of cars that move. So the way it would work again is that we split that up. The, the, what we want is to go from that road to that road, which is the correct. Um, we have two processors and two halos. So we, we have a we have if we have four cells, we actually define a road of length six because these are the, the ghost cells. And in this parallelization, you just fill them in from your neighbors. So you basically do some message passing to copy the data. So that value goes there, that value goes there, that value goes there, and that value goes there. That's the message passing, that's the phoning each other. You store the data locally, so that is just a copy of that value, um, that is just a copy of, um, of that value, because we have purely boundary conditions. So once you've done that, you can then update your whole road, because you know all the information. You just update the road, and then the next, the next iteration, you do some message passing, and then you update the road again. And again, we update the interior cells. This guy knows that he has um, two moves, uh, one move, sorry, and this guy knows he has two moves. And then we need to do a reduction operation to bring them together to give the total number of moves. And so, you know, this is, so that's how you would, that's how you would parallelize this, and we'll, we'll come back to this later on. Um, it's quite similar to, well, it's actually how we would attack the image processing example, which we'll do on, on, on Friday. But just one, there's one technical point at the end, which was, um, I've just been naive here and said that we're going to communicate the data through sends and receives. Imagine that um, we had a large road of, of like 400. So you had 100 cells, you have 100 cells, you have 100 cells, you have 100 cells, okay? And you're in, a, you're in a, this roundabout. We want to communicate the halo data because you want to send your data to your neighbor. What happens if we do it synchronously, like making a phone call? What's going to happen? So you're going to phone her, she's going to phone you, you're going to phone her, going to phone her. So what's going to happen then? The process is going to synchronize, so I'm going to wait for the information from that person to complete my two cells. And yeah, but, how, so, but the first, the naive, thing to, the naive way to write the code is everybody send their data to their upward neighbor, for example, okay? So that's what you're all doing. What happens then? It's deadlock. Down, because of the periodic boundary conditions, everybody is trying to phone their neighbor and go, why aren't they picking up? Okay? Because you are phoning him. So that, that even a very, very simple situation like this, if you use synchronous communications, then you have a problem. The naive way of writing the code, which is send data up the way, receive data down the way, and then you have to repeat it the other way, will deadlock. Okay? Because everybody is sending. If you use synchronous send, then everybody is phoning and nobody's picking up. If you use asynchronous send, like sending an email, it's fine. You just send the data off, it's gone. Then you can turn around and do the receive. But it's very, very important to realize even this simple example, again, two processes, not so obvious, but it's more obvious there, that if you use synchronous send and you do the naive thing, then you have deadlock, okay? How could you, in this case, how could you break the deadlock? 
Yeah. Do it by ensuring that when you send the data, you receive it from the processor downstream every time. You, well, some you can't do both. Like if you're sending data, you're sending data, and that, with synchronous send, that will not complete send until. Send and then receive. Make sure you receive. Once you've sent, uh, once you've sent data. The problem is, yeah. So, Use both on and even. Yes. So the trick, the trick, the simple trick is here to say, like, have odd and even processors. So, you know, if you're an odd processor, zero, uh, one, three, five, seven, you send first, then receive. And if you're an even process, you receive, then send. So that's like saying, you know, you send that way, and then you know that you're odd, odd and even. So you can, you, you can actually solve it in this situation. Through. That's not a general solution. That's what come up. What we'll cover tomorrow is in MPI how in general you solve this. It's called it's called non-block communication. Yeah, Another thing that I can see might happen is you still do the asynchronous uh, send receive. Yeah. Yes, but before just moving to the FDF data on the interior cells, yeah. you ask have all the sends been completed and all the receives been completed. Yeah. That works. So it's like forcing synchronization. Uh, what? No, what you're you're actually asking, you're only waiting for your. So, so what's the prop? So, so we, the way I'm saying is that you would um, let's let's say we do asynchronous communication, yeah. yeah so I, I would I would I would post my I would post my data off there, then I'd receive my data from him, then I would post my data that way and receive it that way, then I then I filled in the boundary data, then I can calculate. So, so you think there's a problem with that? I mean, it's not. Or I was thinking, if, if it is a synchronous, there's um, like no need. If you just advance straight to interior cells, there's no guarantee that every single receiver or every single send is being completed right. Yeah. That was just my point. So if you ask, has it been kept? Has everything been completed? That's always strange. Yeah. So you don't. So this you don't actually have to. You don't actually have to wait for everything to be completed. All you care is that, in fact, all you actually care. What do you need to have completed to update your local road? What do you need to have completed to update your local road? Okay, so you just need the well, you only need your receives to have completed. So you just need to wait, and, and receives are synchronous. So basically, so in fact, you actually only care, if you're using asynchronous sense, you only care that your receives have completed. You don't care if your sends have completed, because they're off there, right? So it's, that, it's, it's actually quite a subtle point, but it, you actually only care, typically, if your receives have completed. Then you might ask, OK, then, but you might say, well, I want a global barrier here to make sure that I don't go on to iteration n plus 1 while other people are. but that doesn't that won't that will never happen because imagine I'm I'm going very very fast right and pardon you're very slow right okay. I'd rush ahead right what's the first thing I do on the next iteration I have to issue a receive and so I have to wait for him to catch up so that's why you you almost never need global barriers basically the men, because receive is always synchronous because it always waits. It just naturally happens that you know the, the synchronization you need happens by default. So people like often will people if people implement this MPI, you often see them put a barrier, global barrier, make sure nobody goes on to iteration. Now. You don't need that because if you think about it, the synchronization is there in the messages. It's actually quite a subtle point to, to think about it quite a lot, but you do not need only in very contrived situations you need global barriers in the MPI. And that is because, fundamentally, it's because receive is synchronous. Because the receive only returns when the data is there. And you, it's a selfish model. Once you've got the receive, you just carry on. You don't really care. Why would I care if he's an iteration ahead or behind? That's up to him. Um, OK, so that's actually, um, hopefully that means, so maybe you need to think about that a bit. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to um, do the lecture on um, what MPI is, and then we'll actually do some real, um, we'll actually do some real uh, programming exercises. So I'll go through this reasonably quickly. So the, the uh, uh, maybe we'll get through this quite quickly because some of you have um, been on um, 
the first couple of days course so you will you'll get onto Archer. But if we've got everyone up on Archer and running submitting jobs by um, by by lunchtime, that, that's a good that's a good situation. And if you want it's a different reservation for today, but I'll cover all that when we get to that stage. So introduction to MPI. I can actually talk about MPI now. Hopefully so what I've talked about previously has actually been about mesh passing in general as a concept. How does message passing work? How do we parallelize how they use message passing? And now I'm actually going to talk about MPI. What is MPI? Well, MPI was the first message passing interface standard. What happened is in the early 90s, when parallel computing became popular, every time you bought a new machine, it had a different way of different message passing library, different syntax, different whatever. Everyone just got really sick of this, and they got together in the early 90s to produce a standard. Um, EPCC was involved in that in 93 there was the first MPI standard document produced and one of the nicest things about MPI is it was it was it grew out of experience that basically people had a had, everyone had their own bash at doing M, uh, doing message passing and then they took the best ideas and stuck them together into MPI so, so, it, so it was it's generally quite good MPI has a library of functions to stop routine calls. It's not a language. There's no reason why you couldn't write a message. There have been thousands of message passing languages invented over the years, but nobody uses them. Um, there is no such thing as an MPI compiler. This isn't a trivial comment. It looks like there, it looks like there is a thing called an MPI compiler, but there isn't. Okay, but it's very important. There's no such thing as an MPI compiler. MPI is a library. It's not a compiler. As I said, co 4 compiler knows nothing about what MPI actually does. The goals and scope of MPI to provide source code portability. That means that if you write a correct MPI program and link it against an MPI library on your laptop, you can compile the same program on the world's largest supercomputer, link against their MPI library, and it will run. Okay? It's also there to allow efficient implementation. So basically, there's no point in providing functionality in MPI, which is nice to use but inefficient, because that means it won't. There's no point in doing parallel programming that's efficient. It offers a lot of functionality, way too much functionality. This is the MPI standard. It's ridiculously big. Most people use about 10 function calls. This is over 700 pages. Um, one of the reasons, so some, of, some, of the, some of the interfaces look a bit weird. And I'll, sometimes that comes down to the fact that in principle, in principle, um, MPI supports heterogeneous parallel architecture. What that means, in the early days, one of the models of parallel computing was, I said, every 10 years, someone has this bright idea to say, oh, when I go home at night, there are more unused desktops and workstations in this, in this James Clark Maxwell building than there are processors in the national supercomputer. Let's run a parallel program across all those computers, okay? And then they play around with a couple of years, and then they all say, oh, it's way too difficult because people switch their machines off, they're not maintained in different operating systems. Then 10 years later, somebody goes, I had this idea, and then the whole cycle goes around and around. And then, but anyway, in principle, MPI allows you to run a single program, MPI, well, a single MPI program, across multiple architectures. Now, of course, now there is only one architecture, there's Intel, but in the old days, things were interesting. There was more than one chip manufacturer, Sun, IBM, <coughs> SGI. So in principle, MPI allows you to run a single program across different architectures, different operating systems. And you might say, well, what happens if that machine stores integers in four bytes, and that inter machine stores integers in eight bytes, or that they both use four bytes for floating point numbers, but one is little endian and one is big endian. Well, MPI is designed, or what happens if that was compiled using Microsoft Visual C++ and that was compiled using Intel C? MPI, in principle, allows it to work in that. Now, nobody does that. Nobody does that now. Everybody runs on, you know, 10,000 Intel processors or 50,000 ARM processors or whatever. But but in principle, it supports that. So some of the complications are because you have to think, well, of course, in a heterogeneous architecture, I couldn't guarantee that an integer here is the same as an integer over there. But it, it's a bit of history. So the first bit of code, um, when you use a library, you have to include lots of stuff. So in C, you do hash include mpi.h, as you do in C++. 4 times 7 percent which hopefully none of you do, you do that. Everyone should be using use mpi. There is actually, there is a more, there is a there's a much more modern interface to the Fortran function calls, where you would um, use MPI underscore F08. It stands for the Fortran 2008 um, interface. Now I don't cover that here um, because 
I should probably update the course, but practice I've not seen this used very much. However, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll refer to it at the end of this lecture, but there is a much more modern interface to MPI. However, the interface I will describe is basically um, the interface as it was in the early 90s, which has some issues with Fortran programs, but is the one which is most commonly used. So every MPI function has a defined format. Almost all, so every MPI function in C is MPI underscore capital letter, lowercase letter with some parameters, and it returns an error code. C being C, you can just ignore the error code. Fortran, for some reason, Fortran programs don't like functions, they like subroutines. I've never understood why, particularly. But in Fortran, Fortran is case insensitive, but it's call MPI function parameters, but the error code is, a, um, is an extra argument. So in Fortran, number one error for Fortran programs, they forgot to forget to put the error code in. You have to put it in even if you never check it. Okay? Um, now in the in the in the modern the most modern Fortran interface, Fortran allows now allows functions to have different numbers of arguments. So if you're using the most most modern Fortran interface you can you can omit that but um, most people don't use that yet. So, so the most common error of a Fortran program is to forget to put the I error argument at the end. That is the most common error. Now, in fact, although you should always check error codes, nobody ever checks error codes in, 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 in MPI. Well, not nobody, but most people don't. The reason is, it's a naughty thing to do, but the default behavior that MPI has on any error, no matter how trivial, is to, is to crash and burn. So basically, if it detects an error, it crashes, it never gets back to you. Now, you can change that behavior, you can make it behave more elegantly, but by default, almost all MPI routines, at least the ones we're covering, um, the default error behavior is to crash and burn, so you will never actually get the error code. You really should check it, but to be honest, most people don't. So just a slightly cryptic, um, MPI controls its own internal data structures. What I'm saying is there are, there are concepts in MPI like groups of processes. Which, which, um, um, which we'll have to refer to. MPI manages all that stuff, and it gives you it gives you references to them. What I mean is exactly analogous to opening a file. Okay, if you open a file in C, you get a file star FP, you get a file pointer back. If you open a file in Fortran, you get a unit number back. You only have to store the file pointer and the unit number. Clearly, internally, there's a whole bunch of state being stored about where you know the, the, what the file is called, where but all this stuff. The same as MPI. MPI, when you define complicated objects in MPI, MPI just gives you back a, what it calls a handle, which you can think of as being like the file pointer or the unit number. Um, in C, the handles are all defined as type def, so each handle we'll see has its own, like uh, a group of processes has, has its own type def um, type. In Fortran, they're all integers. Now, in the, in the more modern interface, they are also user-defined types. The point is that the, the original interface to MPI was defined way back before Fortran 90 even came out, and Fortran didn't used to have the equivalent of structures or defined types. So everything in every handle in MPI, in, 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 in the Fortran interface is just an integer uh, in the, in the, in the old-fashioned interface. So the first, uh, you have to initialize MPI. As I said, when your program starts running, it's just a serial program. So you have to initialize MPI to get things going, and it's called MPI init. Now, unfortunately, it's the first MPI call you've seen, and it has a stupid prototype in C. I'll come back to why that is. In star RGB and three stars, not a world record, but three stars is quite a lot of C. In Fortran, it's MPI init I error. It must be the first MPI procedure called, okay? You're not allowed to do any MPI routines until you call MPI init, but it does not launch the parallel processes, okay? They, basically, when you run an MPI program, you launch a hundred, a thousand, a million programs through this launcher program, which I've talked to. They're already running, okay? MPI and it gets them to talk to each other, but they, it does not launch the multiple processes, okay? They're already in existence. Um, so this is every MPI program starts like this. In C, you do int main arg c car star arg b, so that's a double start, and then you call MPI and it, you point a, pass a pointer to arg c and a pointer to arg b. The reason for this is, it's historical, but you can imagine a situation where you've launched your program from the command line on that computer, maybe only that computer knows the command line arguments for some reason, the other computers don't. This allows MPI to broadcast the command line, because you give it 
because the MPI init function takes the command line arguments, points to them, it allows MPI to, to, to replicate the command line arguments across all processes. However, in fact, most parallel programs don't take command line arguments, and in fact, it's perfectly legitimate just to do this. So most people will just do int main, and it's perfectly legitimate to do MPI init, not not. However, if you are using command line arguments, technically, you should pass pointers to them to the MPI init routine. And technically, you shouldn't refer to argc and argb in your MPI program until, um, you should refer to it until after the init, but it's slightly technical. So that's the first unfortunate thing about MPI. If you're a C programmer, the first routine you see has this stupid interface. Sorry, it's an unfortunately complicated interface. But, but most people you just call it null and null. In Fortran, you should program my MPI program, call the MPI init of our error. So, so that, that's initialized as MPI. Having done that, you can now do MPI calls. And the, one of the most fundamental concepts in MPI is our communicators. In, in MPI, every communication takes place within the communicator. A communicator is fundamentally a group of processes. And so we'll see that what you can do in MPI is we can actually say, right, these three tables on the right, you become one communicator. And all these guys on the left, you're another communicator. And it allows us to insulate communications. So it's a communications world. So every communication routine in MPI takes a communicator as an argument, which defines the group of processes within which that communication can take place. Now, we're not going to use that functionality um, early on, at least. And so there's a predefined communicator called MPI com world, which, which, in, which includes everybody. So if you ever see an MPI routine which requires a communicator, which almost all of them do, it's two communications, you just stick an MPI com world at the start. That means it's taking place, but we've not, done, we've not split the machine up into pieces. It just means everyone can talk to everyone. Okay? So MPI com world is a group of processes which, which contains everybody, contains all the processes. Okay? So the first thing you want to do, if you want to do anything useful in any message passing program, is you have to know who you are. Okay? You have to know, am I the top left, the top right, the bottom left, the bottom right process? Okay? And th that's not inbuilt into the program because you've run an individual copy of the same program in every process. So you have to inquire from within the program, who am I? And an MPI, that's called the rank. So the fundamental, most important object or number you have in MPI is what your rank is. And you get through this via function called MPI comp rank. You pass a communicator which here could be MPI com world, and you get back the rank, okay? So in C, com is of type MPI com, which is some type def. In Fortran, com is just an integer, okay? But um, that's what you do. You call MPI com rank. You say, what is my rank within a communicator? If you think about it, um, the rank is always naught to n minus 1, where n is the size of the communicator. So if you think about it, within different communicators, you have different ranks. Okay? If there was a communicator which included you guys, you'd be ranked 0, 1, 2 within that communicator. But the most important rank is your, is your rank within MPI com world, because that is globally unique. Okay? So that's, you know, your rank within MPI com world is, say, 30 of us. If you said, what is my rank within MPI com world, you would get a unique number between 0 and 29. Okay? So that's your globally unique reference. And that, that then allows you to make decisions about, OK, I'm ranked 0, I'll do that part, I'll write my number. Okay? Is that clear? So that is the most important thing you need to know, your, your, your global rank. It's not related to the physical processor number. It has no physical meaning. You know, your, the processor's doing a machine may be numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. That's a, this is a logical, it's a logical process identifier. It's guaranteed unique. It starts from zero even in Fortran. That's a killer for Fortran programmers. But, you know, hey, the C library. The anti library was written by a bunch of C programmers. They didn't know much about Fortran. Well, they didn't, so it's a bit disingenuous. But, no, you just have to suck it up if you're, if you're a Fortran programmer, but the rank starts at zero. So this is the classic next line in an MPI program in C. In rank, MPI com rank, MPI com world rank. Give me back my rank in MPI com world, and then print hello from rank whatever. Or in Fortran, integer IR, integer rank, call MPI com rank, MPI com world rank, IR, print hello from rank, rank. Okay, so that is the classic thing that you do. Fortran being Fortran, you don't have to worry about passing pointers because everything's passed by reference. In C, you have to worry about um, passing things. Um, if, you get the, if you get things wrong in C, C is much easier to program in the sense that because things like MPI com world are, are typed, they're of type MPI com, 
if you make a mistake, the compiler will probably pick up the prototype is wrong. So this, this expected an integer for the third argument. You've given me a, a real number. Okay. Fortran should be able to do that, but unfortunately, it doesn't work. Typically, it, it, would, it will work in the most modern interface, but in, in an interface that you'll be using, if I miss out the I error here, the compiler will probably not complain, and it will crash at runtime. The reason the compiler won't complain is we'll see later that most MPI calls are actually illegal Fortran, technically. <laughs> and so to get them past the Fortran compiler, you just have to tell the client, look, just don't, don't look at this, right? Don't look, you're not going to like it, so don't look at it. What you'd like it to do is just to count the number of parameters and say, it's both half right. So it's because the reason a lot of these issues come up because Fortran is a much stricter language than C. That, that's one. Because Fortran is much more type specific and much more strict than C you get these issues. But it's an unfortunate problem, but for technical reasons, the compiler will probably not pick up mistakes typoed in Fortran. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. The other thing you might want to know is how many of us there are. When you write an MPI program, you write it in general for any number of processors, right? So I can run 10 copies, 100 copies of it. So it's only at runtime that the number of processors is defined. So again, you have to inquire, it might seem weird, but you have to inquire from within the program how many copies are there, okay? So if there's four, you split right, right into four pieces. There's eight, you split into eight. You need to know that from runtime. And this is called the size. So you ask, the size, you can ask for the size of a communicator. How big is the communicator? So if, I, if you guys were in a communicator ask, what's the size of that communicator? It would be three, because there's three of you. But if I ask the size of COM world, that tells you the total number of processors that are running by definition, okay? So MPI com size, so it's almost every MPI program start MPI net, MPI com rank, MPI com size on com world. What is my unique identifier amongst everybody? How, how many of us are there? And with that information, you can actually do a surprising amount. So you need to know that, it's even in the traffic model. You need to know, if I wanted to run a traffic, uh, a road of length 100, I need to know how many processes there are to know how big my local road is. If there's 10 of us, my local road is 10. If there's 20 of us, my local road is five. Okay, so you need to know that. You also need to know who you are, because you need to know, well, I need to know if I'm ranked three, because I know my neighbors are ranked four and ranked two. So you need to know those, those two pieces of information. To exit MPI, you have to call finalize at the end with American spelling. It must be the last MPI procedure called if you, one of the exercises is not to call it to see what happens, weird things happen sometimes. But the most important point is that you don't call MPI init, MPI finalize, MPI init. You call MPI init, then you run your program for 10 hours, and you call MPI finalize, then you stop. Okay? It's not if you've done OpenMP, the kind of equivalent construct in OpenMP are parallel regions. But in OpenMP, the model is you, you start the parallel region, you finish it, you start it, you finish it. That's not the, the MPI model. The MPI model is it's parallel right from the start. So you call MPI net, it says you run for 10 hours, you call for MPI finalize, and you, you, you finish. Okay, you don't, in fact, you're not allowed to call MPI net after you've called MPI finalize. You can abort MPI, as I said, there is a function called MPI abort here, which actually, if it's called by one process, it kills everything. It's a horrible thing, and your program will crash and dump core, and you'll use up all your disk space and everything. Sometimes it is, and this is the nuclear option, this is your line of life. You should try and handle errors cleanly. You should, you know, if you have an error, you should flag up to everybody, you should stop. But sometimes you can get into a situation where, you know, you, it's a catastrophic error, you just want to stop and you don't want deadlock. So you call MPI abort, everybody in, in, in COM, this could be COM world, it's killed. But it is a horrible nuclear last option resort, but it's just useful to know that it's there. But it should not be your standard way of finishing an MPI program. The other thing which is useful is what machine am I on? Um, as I said, you've launched a parallel program, okay, and let's have the model where uh, our parallel computer is made up of lots of laptops, okay? It's easy to get it wrong, and I want to launch 100 processes, so let's say there's 25 laptops here, let's say they're all quad-core laptops, I want to run four processes on each laptop, okay? It's easy sometimes to get it wrong, get run 100 processes on that laptop. That laptop's perfectly capable of running under processes. Laptops run thousands of processes all the time. That's just not what we wanted. How, you, how do you know that? Well, it can be quite difficult to tell, except your program runs like a, um, a slow at anything. You can ask MPI, what is the name of the machine I'm on? And it's a slightly old syntax. It's called MPI get processor name. 
the, the, this, this function was clearly defined in the early 90s when every machine only had a single processor. But what this is actually gives you back is what is the name of the machine I'm running on? It gives you back a string, which gives you back, so you can do um, in C, um, uh, on C it's much easier. Character prop name, MPI max processor name, MPI get processor name, and you can say I'm on machine blah. And that can give you some confidence that, you're, that, you've, that your program is running where you thought it was running. Okay? So that could be, you say I'm running on Fred's laptop, I'm running on Jim's laptop, or whatever you've called your machine, Gandalf or whatever. Machines. Um, on Archer, this will just be some number, node 57, node 58, but it, it is a useful. So that's actually quite fun, and one of the exercises to play around with that. That can be a useful debugging exercise just to, just to uh, make yourself, uh, just to convince yourself that, you're, um, that you know what you're doing. So covered some basic calls. Um, it's called the message passing model. I haven't actually told you how to send messages yet, but we could still write useful programs. So imagine I said I had 100 files I wanted to process in parallel. I could just run an MPI program with 100 processes. And each process could say, what rank am I? I'm rank 63, or then I'll process file 63. So you could, you could write fairly trivial but useful programs in this. Um, but there are a couple of, so the exercise are really just to get up and running. So what I'll do, actually, Gordon, could you help me? Could you? So I have two things here. I have a crib sheet. Those of you who are on the hands-on intro course will, will know all this stuff, but I've given a, a quick crib sheet as to how to um, log on to an archer. And I, this, all the exercises are contained on this exercise sheet. So <coughs> these are all on the web, but um, okay. so the things that you don't have, well, quite well on yet. The things that you don't know yet are. <laughs> <laughs> so, the things you don't know yet are, you don't know the password, but it is the same as, as last, as the first two, it's 10DTSM-D6HM1. We're going to get that wrong, but I'll give you a hand with that. Uh, these are auto-generated. I think the systems people sometimes actually rev up in giving us um, giving us strange uh, passwords. And I don't know if there's a we have to submit to a reservation, and it's it's the reservation for this morning for technical reasons. We have a different reservation each day. This is the reserved queue. For technical reasons, we have two reservations today. That's not ideal, but we had to do it because of some maintenance issues, but the, for, for this morning, the reservation is R4599305. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a quick overview, a quick run through of how MPI works on Archer. And then we can get into it and then see what the other So this um, lecture actually covers actually covers how to run Arch on a machine called Cirrus, how to run MPI on a machine called Cirrus. Uh, Cirrus is a local cluster I use for the MSC, so I'll skip the Cirrus stuff. I just leave it in the left. So um, to access, this is on the script sheet, but you just need to use SSH to use our at login.archer.a3k, where your user is guest 27 or whatever it is. That's what the crib sheet kind of tells you how to go through the stuff. Minus X, minus Y, I know people use max, minus Y seems to work better than minus X. Minus Y says it's a trusted, I never know, it's a trusted connection. Mac users seem to have problems with SSH minus X. Um, Why is it supposed to be pressing the I think it's actually the trusted, the trusted. There's some, there's some, if you do SSH minus X, it's an untrusted connection, and there's some timeout on Max every 10 minutes of time, or something, I never quite understand. Macs are weird because they've, they've tried to pretend they're not using Unix, so you, you, you have to, we can help you install it. Is anyone using Windows? It'll only take five minutes to get set up with SSH and PuTTY and things like that. It doesn't, it's not a big deal. Uh, it won't take it, won't take it um, Useful files and templates. The thing called MPI, I don't give out any code on this course. Um, however, I have given you the solutions if you want the solutions. Um, 
But uh, there are some templates in this MPP templates, uh, which are on the course web pages, um, and uh, it has a few useful bits and pieces which you may find useful. Um, um, the crib sheets, the MPI, so I think the crib sheets are useful. If you weren't here Monday, Tuesday, not, not, not logged on to Archer, then the crib sheets just tell you the minimal stuff you need to get on target. As I said, I'm not really concerned about how Archer works here because I'm teaching you MPI. We're just using Archer as a platform. So I'm just giving you a, a prescription to run on Archer. Hopefully as easy as possible to do. So compiling MPI programs on Archer. So, Fortran programmers should use FTN and C programmers should use CC. Now, these are, you might think of these as MPI compilers. They're not actually MPI compilers. They're just wrappers which call the, the Cray Fortran and Cray C compiler. But they appear to be compilers. They're just a wrapper because it puts all the include paths and link paths and all that rubbish in for you. But, the, but you know, there is no, although, you often run a special compiler to compile MPI programs. It's just a wrapper which under the hood calls the C or Fortran. And we will by default use the Cray compilers, which are Cray FTN and Cray CC. Um, I've given you a couple of very simple make files if you want, or you can just compile by hand. Okay. And again, on the crib sheet, it tells you how to, how to compile this way. Uh, compiling is quite slow on Archer. It's not actually compiling the slow, it's linking that's slow. Um, I can explain why, but if your, your program may appear to take 30 seconds to compile, that's actually taking 30 seconds to link, because linking is quite slow on Archer for technical reasons. Um, so don't worry about that. Archer idiosyncrasies, one of the things which is, means that Archer possibly isn't the ideal platform for um, teaching the course, although it works in practice, is you can't run parallel programs on the front end. So when you log into Archer, you're on a front end login node. And on a lot of systems, you can run MPI programs on the login node, which is useful for debugging and such like. On Archer, you cannot. On Archer, you cannot run parallel programs on the login nodes. You have to submit your job to the, to, if you think of this as the parallel computer, these are all the nodes here. I'm the login node. You log in to me, you have to submit jobs to these parallel resources. Um, so there can be a substantial delay in the batch queues, but we, we may have some kind of dedicated queues, and we do. So we have dedicated queues, and you'll see you'll see in the instructions. I call it RXXXX. It's R four five double nine three zero five for this morning. That's the queue. That's your. That will only work for the guest account. It will give you not instant but rapid turnaround. The other slightly weird thing is that Archer has two file systems: slash home and slash work. When you log in, you're in slash home, your home directory. You cannot run. You cannot easily run parallel programs from there. For technical reasons, the back-end nodes, which is the main body of Archer, can only see slash work. The simplest thing to do is to do everything in slash work. So change directory slash work, slash y40, slash y40, slash guest xx, and do everything from there. You will forget sometimes to do that. You'll log in, you'll run a parallel program, you'll get some weird error message, like can't write output or file not found or something. That means you're running in your home directory. It's a slight work in Archer, but you there's work you have to run from the work file directly, but it's not your default home. Again, this is all in the crib sheet. To run on the Archer back end, you run via batch system and it's called PBS. So you write that you have to write the batch file which tells you how to run the job and you queue sub it. However, I have I have done a um, 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 I'm trying to say. I've done a shorthand. I've, so I've, I've given you a default batch file, which I think is called Arch for MPI. This is in the MPP templates uh, file. And you just need to co make a copy of it. So I think you may have done this on, on days one and two. It's just a, like I said, I don't want to bother teaching you about how the batch system works and how PBS works. We just want to use it as a way of launching jobs. So I've given you a batch file called archerempi.pbs, and you just copy that. If you want, you have an executable, executable called hello, you just copy archerempi.pbs to hello.pbs, and that's all you need to do. That will then run a program called hello. If your, if your program is called a.out, you would have to copy archerempi.pbs to a.out.pbs. Okay? So you just make a copy of that file with the, with, with the right name, and then it will run that executable. And there's an argument in, in, the, um, um, in the batch file called nprox, or nproc, 
and you, which you have to alter to run the program on more on different numbers of processes. By default, it only runs on four, uh, but again, this is all explained in the crib sheet. Um, the output appears in the batch. So basically, you submit the job, and once it's run, the output appears in a batch file called, say, hello.pbs.oxxx, where xxx is, 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 is some number you were given. Um, so again, you'll be familiar with this if you hear Monday, Tuesday. If not, this might be new to you. But we can sort all this out. Um, final thing, the C++ interface, MPI is not an OA o interface. However, it can be called from C++. Now, in the early days, they, they, they supported a, C, a special C++ interface to, to MPI. So I'm not a C++ programmer, but for example, um, the, uh, the, the functions were methods on a communicator object. So you would do com equals MPI com world, and, and you would do, instead of MPI com rank, you do rank equals com dot get rank, and size equals com dot get size. And they see that the, um, there was a separate wrapper. Actually, that's, that, that's for, um, apologies. Um, the, um, is, it, is it CC? Okay, CC on the correct. So that's, that's for a, if you want to use the C++ compiler on the Cray, C++ compiler is called CC, capital letter CC, where C is called CC, lowercase. So if you want to call the, you want to call the C++ compiler, you want to call the capital CC. Um, but this just became too much work. So th this C++ interface is now deprecated. It may work, but it's not supported. So what you should do if you're a C++ programmer, you just call the MPI library as if it were as if they were C routines, and that, that interface with C plus plus and C as well was fine. So to, to, to a C plus plus program, MPI just appears like a library of C routines, and you just have to use it in the correct, the way that you would normally follow C routine from, from C plus plus. We can cover that. The standard, the MPI standard is available online at this place. It's currently version 3.1. This is version 3.0 gone from green to blue. Uh, you can get a printed version. These guys will sell you a printed version. The, luckily, the man pages are available. So if you want to know, um, if you type man MPI routine name, you will get information on that routine. So you can do, on, on the user, you can, uh, on, on Arch, you can do man MPI in it. You have to use the C spelling here, capital letter, small letter, um, even if you're a Fortran programmer. But, um, uh, that they, they are available, or you can just Google it. There's some very decent Google Command pages. As I said, it is something of a large book. If you want to learn MPI, these guys uh, who were involved in designing MPI, Grop, Lusk, and Skellum, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, have written this. I used to not be a fan of this book in the early days because it used to read very much like a manual. But actually, maybe maybe I'm out. Then maybe I was uh, prejudiced, but actually the most recent version, and possibly but this most recent version is very, very good. If you want to get a book out, this is the book to get because it, it, it does a number of things. It motivates MPI. It doesn't just talk about how MPI is designed. It talks about why it's designed that way. You know, it takes an example which is very similar to my image processing example, and takes that example through and shows you how to develop it. So this is actually a very, this is a very good book. Um, if you want. I'm, it's not, I'm not involved in it. I'm not plugging my own book in any way. But this is a very good book um, if you want to if you want to learn about MPI. So this the, the MPI reference manual is really a reference manual. It's not reading reading material. However, this MPI book is reading material. You can read it and learn a lot. These guys um, really know what they're talking about. So the exercise Hello World is the minimal MPI program. It's exercise one on the exercise sheet. Write an MPI program that prints a message to the screen. If we get you all up and running and um, and running, um, okay. So this shows history. That's um, that should be on Archer. Apologies. I have to, I run this course on so many platforms. I um I, I sometimes I get the naming wrong. Um, I give you some very basic template code. When I say notes, the one thing I didn't point out is if I go to the the website. So what we want you to do is to write a program which prints Hello World, and you'll see there's a few extensions. Um, and if we can get that up and running in parallel, everyone logged on, that's quite good. Um, if you go to the to the web page, to the course material, you'll see at the bottom here there are some notes. 
Now, I've, ne I've labeled them as historical. Originally, when we first wrote this course, we, we maintained a set of slides and a complete set of notes. But it became way too much effort to, to keep the notes up to date. So I, I treat the notes as being, um, as being um, a, like a, a book of historical interest. I mean, it's still it's slightly out of date, but maybe useful to read. However, whenever I say do an exercise, I mean do the exercise on the sheet I handed you out. Okay? There are exercises in the notes. When I say do exercise one, two, three, four, five, it's exercises as specified in the um, NPI exercise sheet, which you have a copy of. Okay? However, there are some places where I may refer to the notes. And here, as it says here, um, page four or five of the notes have, have some basic. Basic code. But I just want you to write the program which for Hello World uses MPI COM, innate to MPI finalized, MPI COM rank and MPI COM size to find out who you are, how many of you are, print that information on the screen, and just check and get things up and running. So, as I said, it's by lunchtime, everyone's got up and running, they compile and run a code on the back end. That's about quite a success. 